So as you guys know, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at Life Mission Church. And just to bring you guys up to speed on where we have been as a church for the past almost two years now, we have been going through the book of Matthew. And we are coming to a close, finally, after almost two years. And we're so excited to wrap this book up. Um, But also very excited about where we are uh, these last final few weeks leading up to Easter. And so, uh, as you guys know, a lot of you know, is uh, the past few weeks we've been going through uh, just sort of be- right before the crucifixion scene. A few weeks ago, we were in the scene of the Last Supper where Jesus was telling his disciples that one of the disciples would, that, Jesus, that Peter would deny him and that one of his disciples would betray him. And then uh, last week, we looked at and Joby did a great job just painting this picture of the, the wrath of God, the cup that Jesus had to drink for us at the cross. And so today, we are at the place where we're going to be talking about two men. We're going to be talking about Peter and talking about Judas. And further, we're going to be talking about how we all have regrets. We all have regrets in life. And these two men, one of them started with regret and led to repentance. And the other man had regret, which led to despair. And how we can see the difference between true godly repentance and just a, simply a regret that leads to a despair. So what about you? What do you regret in your life? As you think about your past, and some of the things you have done, some of the things you have said, some of the relationships in your life that maybe you have messed up, said things that you didn't mean. We all have these regrets, and not all of the regrets we have lead to a good place. Sometimes they lead to despair, don't they? Sometimes we don't Take our regrets to the cross of Christ. So this morning, that's what we'll be discussing. And you guys open up to Matthew 20, chapter 26, verse 69, and I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. Father, you're such a good, amazing, powerful, merciful, redeeming, just God of second chances, God. And God, we come before you this morning just asking that your Holy Spirit be with us. Your Holy Spirit would teach us. Your Holy Spirit, through the word of God, would convict us of sin, but wouldn't simply leave us there would teach us, God, how to have a lifestyle, a daily lifestyle of repentance, God. So God, be with us. We love you, God. We thank you. I thank you so much for everyone here, God. Fill my words up with you, God, and not me. And put me behind your word, Lord, so that you, God, would be glorified this morning. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Okay, chapter twenty. 6, verse 69. Here we go. So now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And then he began to invoke a curse on himself. And he began to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. 
chapter 27. When morning came, all of the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him. Here is Jesus bound. And led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Verse 3. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. For they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then it was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. And so as we look at this, we see that Peter denied Jesus three times. And in this moment where Peter denies Jesus three times, we see that Jesus is bound. And we see Judas betraying Jesus. We see at the center part of the gospel story, the main character, faithful and true, is being faithful and his disciples are being faithless. So we see Peter and Judas. Again, we're going to look at these supporting actors of this story. We see that they are unfaithful, even though, guys, let's think about these men and how they have been set up for success. For three years, these men, first they were chosen as disciples to be shepherded by Jesus. They had been loved by Jesus. They were friends of Jesus. And remember just recently, a few weeks ago, we talked about how they had their feet washed by Jesus. Imagine this. So check out chapter 27, verse 3. We look at Judas and break down what happened with Judas first. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, stop right there. So we see that Judas saw Jesus condemned, right? And it almost seems like he has compassion in this moment, doesn't it? And continuing on in verse 3, it says that he changed his mind and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders. So he's feeling remorse. Going a little further there. In verse 4, He says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, they said. See that it is to us. See see to it yourself. So he says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. He's regretting what he's done. It sounds like he's confessing, doesn't it? It sounds like he's remorseful. This isn't the Judas that we know, is it? Up until this point? And he actually throws down the pieces of silver into the temple and he departs. He's filled with a regret over what he did. So in the verses up into this point, Judas acknowledges his sin and Jesus' innocence. We see that he's confessed. We see that he's brought back the money. But his worldly sorrow and regret... He just has a worldly sorrow 
a worldly regret here, which actually leads him to a despair to hang himself. So Judas's regret and his sorrow, it was godless. Yes, he grieved over the terrible thing he has done. Yes, he confessed. Yes, he gave back the money. He turned from his sin. But did he turn to God? Instead of trusting that God forgives, he turned to despair. Again, verse 5, he departed and he hung himself. His regret didn't lead him to repentance. His regret led him to despair. He never understood grace and forgiveness. He had this godless regret, so he either believed one of two things. He either believed he was beyond forgiveness or that he had to atone for his own sin. He even sacrificed himself. Judas believed that his sin was bigger than God's grace. He never saw the beauty of Jesus and he never made true, real eye contact in a loving way. See, Judas had a head knowledge. He was around Jesus. He knew Jesus here, but never seeped down to his heart. Now let's look at Peter. Check out verse 75, chapter 26, verse 75. And Peter remembered He remembered the saying of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So we see that both men sinned and both men sinned royally. But why do we want to name our children Peter and not Judas? I don't know one Judas. Peter's life had a different outcome, didn't it? Why? See, we see here that if we look at these verses, Peter remembered the words of Jesus. This was what brought Peter to himself. He remembered that Jesus said, you were going to betray me. Let us not forget, too, that Jesus gave him this warning. It was Jesus that told him this. And Peter said, Lord, I would never do that. And in this moment, Peter has a serious reflection on the words of Jesus for Peter and for us to have true godly regret, true godly repent, repentance. We must remember. We must remember the words of Jesus. Another thing Peter did and in the Gospel of Luke records that Peter looked at Jesus, that Jesus made eye contact with him, that before this, Peter did not even hear the rooster crowing. And once Jesus locked eyes with Peter, Peter began to weep bitterly. He began to remember the words of Jesus and make eye contact with Jesus. This is what made him broken. It's because Peter knew Jesus. He knew Jesus here. The words of Jesus would help break his heart. The words of Jesus are powerful interjection to repentance. The Lord's words to Peter before this in Luke 22 verse 32 where Jesus actually prays for Peter and he says, I have prayed to you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So he prays for his to last through difficult times. And let's jump ahead, and you guys can go ahead and turn there, to John 21. And this is after Jesus rose, and the disciples had just gone fishing. They had came back for breakfast And in John 21, verse 15, it says, 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, he said, Simon, which is another name for Peter. This is Peter here. Son of John. He says, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. That's one time. He said to him, feed my lambs. He's saying, feed my church. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him a third time, feed my sheep. And here, in this moment, even though Peter had messed up so royally, he is reinstated. Although Peter fails, he was restored according to God's merciful and gracious plan. Jesus says about his own, he says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them from me. Not even you. Are, you're not able to snatch yourself out of God's hands and God's grip. Not even your huge sins can do that, as we see through Peter's life. And it's by the grace of God that Peter is forgiven, and he ends up preaching at Pentecost. And he goes on to lead the first church, writes first and second Peter. And church history says that while he was crucified, he was asked to be crucified upside down. God had changed Peter's heart. Peter goes on to finish his life well. So Peter, his life testifies. He testifies that in spite of his radical and serious fall, there's a big word, nonetheless, nonetheless, he repented he was forgiven, he was restored, and he endured to the end. You'll see in your notes a quote by Charles Spurgeon. And it says, Learn this lesson, not to trust Christ because you repent, but trust Christ to make you repent. Not to come to Christ because you have a broken heart, but to come to him that you, he may give you a broken heart. Not to come to him because you are fit to come to him, but to come to him because you are unfit to come to him. Stop right there. We don't go to Jesus once we are cleaned up, once we have cleaned up ourselves. We go to Jesus to be cleaned up. And he gives us the shower. And he cleanses us by his blood. And he does this at salvation, and he does this the rest of our lives as we come to him and draw near to him. Continuing on, the Spurgeon quote says, Your fitness is your unfitness. Your qualification is your lack of qualification. This is Peter. Christian, this is you. And this is me. For us to repent, for us not to simply sit in our past regrets, it's not simply sitting there, but moving and having a true, genuine heart change. So you see that both men were faithless here, but Peter finishes his race well, and Judas does not. To describe this further and what this really is and looks like, Paul in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, For godly grief, a godly grief, it produces a repentance that actually leads to salvation without regret. 
Whereas worldly grief, it produces death. A godly sad regret, guys, over sin, it produces a repentance. That's the fruit of it. Godly and true repentance is evidence that the truth of the blood of Jesus has actually woken us up, has made us alive. And it brings about forgiveness where we understand forgiveness and grace. So for those of us who have made real eye contact with Jesus and seen the beauty of the gospel, there is no condemnation for your past. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. James 4.8 says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You see, as from that Spurgeon quote, we're unfit. As we draw near to God, and we position ourselves under the waterfall of grace, he cleans us up. And guys, weeping, as Peter did, is not the end goal. To be broken over our sin. Worship is. Another great example of a true broken-hearted man that leads, his, that, that turns his life from a moment of just utter, utter, uh, just mess up, was, was King David, who had just messed up royally with Bathsheba, as you guys know. And after that, uh, in Psalm 51, 10, records this attitude that he has after he realizes what he's done. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take your holy, not your Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. That's the heart of someone who's genuinely regretful for what they've done. They want that heart change. They're asking for God to take away their sin and replace their heart. In Paul and Romans, Chapter 7, verse 24 said, Wretched man am I who will deliver me from this body of death. So see, he understands who he is. I'm a wretched man. But he doesn't stop there. Because that would be the first half of the gospel of recognizing who you are, a sinner, broken. And then he says this, But thanks, not despair. His regret and his sin does not lead him to despair. Instead, to gratitude and thankfulness. Where he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Even though I'm a wretched man. So godly sorrow is so often coupled with weeping. A heavy brokenness that leads to a heartfelt conviction that we have actually offended God the Father by our sin. This burning conviction, it produces in our hearts a godly sorrow. As, guys, as. We remember the words and we make eye contact with him who had his hands pierced for us. And we are deeply grieved. So I ask, what about you? Are there sins that you've committed in your life that you keep living in? Something of the past that you keep bringing up. Maybe there's something that you've dealt with. That it's been paid for by the blood of Christ. But yet you keep running back into that jail cell. You've been freed. And you keep going back to it. It's unrepentant. And I wanted to ask, how do you respond after you blow it big time? Is it like Judas where it leads you to despair? Or is it like Peter where you stand under the waterfall of grace? 
and your heart gets changed? Are you in this daily life of repentance and confessing sin to one another? If not, why? What's stopping you? So in our text today, we see the disciples completely faithless and Jesus faithful. We see that Jesus is bound. It seems that Jesus is defeated. And these are the moments so often that we are blowing it and we are sinning is when we actually, it feels like Jesus is not king in our lives, but that he is bound. We're still treating him sometimes like he is bound. There are moments when we fail and we deny him and it seems like the enemy's won. This truth can bring us to our knees though when we realize that Jesus is faithful even when we are faithless. That despite our most wicked regrets and sins, Christians, you realize you are forgiven. You are forgiven. In Ephesians 1 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. You have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. His disciples in this moment, their sin is being paid for in the same exact moment that they are being faithless. In Romans 5 verse 6, it says, For for while we were still weak, not when you cleaned yourself up, not when you were perfect, but when you were weak, when you were denying and when you were betraying Jesus. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for you and for me. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God, and here is the good news, here is why we don't have to run back to the jail cell of our sin, where we are free, because he was bound in chains for us. We don't have to go back. And bind ourselves up again. Verse 8 says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified, we have been made right by the blood of Christ, much more shall we be saved from him, from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were enemies. In this moment, It feels like Peter is an enemy, doesn't it? While we were enemies, while we were doing things like Peter did, Christ reconciled us to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by this life? More than that, guys, we don't simply run away from the jail jail cell and run away from our sin, but we rejoice. We rejoice in what Jesus has done for us and how he has freed us from our past regrets, even if they were five minutes ago. And like I say a lot, even the ones we haven't even got to yet. So more than that, we also we rejoice in God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom we now have received reconciliation. We've been brought back to God. That he has purchased the keys of the jail cell and he has those keys and we can't snatch them out of his hand by our sin and our regret. Jesus knew you guys. He foreknew that his disciples would do this to him, that his friends would betray him. He predicted it. And he knows what you are going to do before you do it. Yet he has chosen you to be his. He has redeemed, he redeemed Peter. And today, I proclaim with joy this morning to you guys. We can rejoice in this, you guys. 
And in closing, you guys, I close with Peter's words that we so often as a church in the last three years have reminded ourselves with. And these words I love so much and just as a reminder as we think about Peter's life and how he messed up so bad and yet God would use him in this way to remind his church for centuries to come of this amazing truth. And Peter in his life said, we are a chosen race. We are hand-picked, Christian. We're a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, a people of his own possession. We are his. And we are his. He cleans us up so that we could proclaim the gospel. We could proclaim the excellencies of Jesus who called us out of darkness and has brought us into his marvelous light. Amen? So the proper response to our sin. Past, present, it's not despair. It's not, oh, I messed up again. It's not to turn back to that jail cell. It's realizing that God's grace is bigger than your sin. This week, an amazing godly man passed away. Uh, Jerry Bridges, I don't know if you guys have ever read Disciplines of Grace. Um, and he has a lot of other amazing books. And so uh, I wanted to take that quote that he had. And it was actually him. I didn't realize I threw this in my sermon, and God's grace is bigger than your sin. I didn't ac actually realize that I got that from him years ago. So I want to read a quote from him, and he says, God's grace is bigger than all of our sins. Repentance is one of the Christian's highest privileges. Because I think sometimes we hear that word repentance, and it makes us feel not so comfortable. But it's a privilege to be able to repent. A repentant Christian focuses on God's mercy and God's grace. Any moment in our lives when we bask in God's mercy and we bask in God's grace, this is our highest moment. Higher than we feel when we're feeling great about ourselves over our decent performance and we can't think of anything we need to confess. You guys know that moment. Hey, can I pray for you? No, man, I'm good. I don't have anything to confess. Sitting in God's grace is better than that. It's better than that. That has a potentially glorious moment, he says. For we could, at the moment, accept God's abundant mercy and grace and go forth with nothing to boast except Christ himself. Or else we could struggle with our shame, focusing on what as well. We could just focus on our track record. So we ch can choose to accept God's grace or focus on our track record. We fail because we have shifted our attention from grace and from mercy. One who draws on God's grace and God's mercy is quick to repent and slow to sin. Amen? So the next time you sin, instead of running to despair, guys, do as Peter did. Make eye contact with Jesus, remembering his words, and believing that God's grace is bigger than your sin. That Jesus is faithful even when you are faithless giving you gospel confidence to preach his word locally, globally, and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you this morning just so humbled and so amazed, God, that you would send your son and that your son would know how he would be treated, not just by his enemies, but by his quote-unquote friends. 
by, by Peter, who is his, he knew all this would happen, and he knew, yet, Lord, he was faithful in it. That, Lord God, we just thank you so much that you are faithful, even despite our faithlessness. That God, no matter what we do in this life, if we are chosen by you, you will not lose us. You will hold us. Nothing will snatch us from your hand, not even us. And so God, understanding this grace and this mercy will lead us to repentance and not despair, Lord. Your good news, Lord God, will free our minds and free our hearts when we understand and we believe the love of God and how much love you have for us. How deep the Father's love is for us, Lord. I pray if there's anyone here right now that is struggling with any unconfessed sin, that, Lord God, you would free them. Lord God, you would open up their eyes, open up their mind, Lord God, that they don't have to clean themselves up to come to you, but they go to you so that you can clean them up. And that you would free them from that, Lord God. I just ask, Lord God, if there's anyone here that needs prayer this morning, that they would come forward they would be humble enough to admit their inadequacy this morning, that they are struggling, and that there wouldn't be anyone here that would leave with regret. That we would take our regrets and take our sins and we would lay it before the cross this morning. So that, so that, so that, God, your blood would give us a spiritual bath this morning. That we would remember that your grace, God, is bigger than our sin. We thank you so much for that truth, God. And now I pray that it would actually impact our lives. So God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.